light these candles as a reminder of Christ's presence in our life and the light that has surpassed the darkness of all our being and all our community. So we rejoice in the light that never goes out. Amen. On behalf of the community of Melville United Church, I welcome you here to this service and um, just pray that this service will be of um, help, of, um, of spiritual nurture and new life. I'm, my name is uh, Steve Huntley. I was a minister here many years ago. And I'm glad to be back uh, and to be part of this summer series that uh, Melville is doing. Um, there'll be a couple of other speakers as we uh, journey through this uh, summer time. I want to be a big shout out, I guess. We'll use that word to a thank you for a, a, a birthday card I got after being here at the 150th anniversary. I got it in the mail, and I was just shocked that uh, there were so many signatures on that wish, wishing me well. It just happened to be my 65th, so they were really um, going big. But to see all those names brought back a lot of memories, and uh, it was just a, just a great surprise. So thank you, Melville United Church. And as our practice, we acknowledge that we live on the traditional territories of the Atawandaran, Wyandot, Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee First Nation. These are treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit Between the Lakes Treaty. They are also part of the Crown Grant to the Six Nations, the, the referred to as the Haldeman Grant. Grateful for their stewardship of this land, we humbly seek to live together in pursuit of justice and right relations. And let us join together in our call to worship. O oh God, how great you are. On the first day of the week, we commemorate your creation of the world and all that is in it. Thank you for the light which makes us morning by morning and for that greater light which shines in Jesus Christ. Our God, how great you are. On the first day of the week, you raised Jesus from the dead. Raise us with him to a new quality of faith and life. O oh God, how great you are. Again on the first day of the week, you sent your spirit on your disciples. Do not deprive us of your spirit, but renew him in us day by day. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is uh, Come Let Us Sing the Lord our God, and Suzanne is uh, going to uh, lead us into that music. It's on, if you're following along or singing along, it's Voices 222. Lord, our song, we have stood silently too long. Surely the Lord deserves our praise, so joyfully thank God for our days. Oh, thirsty 
thirsty soul, come and drink at the well. God's living waters will never fail. Walk with your vision, help to stand. Strengthened and comforted by God's hand. Dwell among us and cause us to pray and walk with each other following your way. Our precious brothers and sisters will grow in the fulfilling love they know. Desert shall bloom and mountain shall sing to the desire of all living things. I'm all you frosted cake and low. Let your praises endlessly flow. Thank you, Suzanne. Let us join together in our opening prayer. O oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you in this time of worship, seeking your wisdom, your spirit, your love, your grace. We thank you for the days of this past week, for the opportunity to serve you in our own place and time, in our own stations. So give us strength, give us grace, and above all, give us hope as we turn to another day and to the possibilities that this following week affords us. So in silence, we offer to you our own prayers. Hear, O God, these are our prayers. Renew us in this day. Be our friend, our confidant, again our hope. Awake, O sleeper, do not be afraid, for God is with you. Amen. We're going to hear some ministry of music, so enjoy that section of our service.
journey through some popular Canadian songs. And uh, of course, we are celebrating uh, our nation's birthday over these next days, and trust that you'll be an op opportunity to uh, be with others and to remember the great land that God has given to us. Our scriptures this morning are from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 to 6, and from the Gospel of John chapter 9, 1 to 34. Reading from the um, Good News Bible. The apostles said to the Lord, Make our faith increase. The Lord answered, If you had faith as big as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry bush, Pull yourself up by the roots and plant yourself in the sea, and it would obey you. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, 1 to 34, it's the story of the healing of the man born blind. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? Jesus answered, His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with his spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and said, Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This means sent. So he went, washed his face, and came back seeing. His neighbors then, and the people who had seen him begging before this, asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, he is the one. But others said, no, he isn't. He just looks like him. So the man himself said, I am the man. How is it that you can now, now see, they asked him. And he answered, the man called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes and told me to go to Siloam and to wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? they asked. I don't know, he answered. Then they took, the Pharise took to the Pharisees the man they had, who had been blind. That day that Jesus made the mud and cured him when his blindness was a Sabbath. The Pharisees then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He told them, he put some mud in my eyes, and I washed my face, and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, the man who did this cannot be from God, for he does not obey the Sabbath law. Others said, how could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was a division among them. So the Pharisees asked the man once more, you may be cured you say you cured of your blindness. Well, what do you say about him? He is a prophet, the man answered. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents and asked them, Is this your son? You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? Parents answered, we know that he is our son and we know that he was born blind, but what we do not know is how he is now able to see, nor do we know who cured him of his blindness. Ask him, 
He's old enough and he can answer for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities who had already agreed that anyone who said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That is why his parents said he is old enough. The second time they called back to the man and he'd been born blind and said to him, Promise before God that you will tell the truth. We know that this man who cured you is a sinner. I do not know if he is a sinner or not, the man replied. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. What did he do to you, they asked. How did he cure you of your blindness? I have already told you, he answered, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciples. They cursed him and said, you are the fellow's disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, what a strange thing that is. How do you know where he comes from? You don't know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, no one has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do such a thing. And they answered, you were born and brought up in sin, and you are trying to teach us? And they expelled him from the synagogue. When Jesus heard that it happened, he found the man and asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, Tell me he, who he is, sir, so I can believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have already seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you now. I believe, Lord, the man said, and knelt down before Jesus. Jesus said, I came to this world to judge so that the blind should see and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard them say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we are blind. Jesus answered, If you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. Here ends our reading. May God add his blessing to this his holy word. Let us pray. Dear God, as we move into this time of reflection and of, uh, of messaging, open our ears and eyes to your glorious light and love in our lives. Move us to uh, do and to walk in the ways that you have shown us Open our eyes to the present. Give us hope for the future. And that's these things we pray. Amen. Well, again, it's good to be back. <laughs> there's not as many people here today as there was the last time. But there's a good crew on hand, and they're doing good work. And Lillian and and Barry and Suzanne, so we thank them and many others who uh, are, are um, helping in making these services possible. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. In Luke's gospel, Jesus' disciples have been traveling with him for some time. They've seen and heard the amazing things that he is, that, and various acts and wonders. They've seen and heard things that they couldn't possibly imagine before they decided to follow Jesus. They have been amazed and sometimes shocked even at his words and deeds. So in chapter 17, Jesus has been teaching his disciples on a subject of sin, faith, and duty, as Luke records. In either 
And even after all they've seen and heard, they appear bewildered at the demands that Jesus sets forth. And they respond to him in the only way they could think of. Lord, increase our faith. I'm betting that all of us here and all of us online would say much the same thing in the same situation. And perhaps we've often thought of that. Lord, increase my faith. What Jesus had asked of him, and perhaps too for, for us sometimes, seems monumental. How could we meet all the demands and standards that we hear? No sinning. Forgive someone 70 times 7, etc., etc. They and we need more faith. So we ask for it. We've heard the word faith since our youth or perhaps first from you became a Christian. It's always important to go over exactly what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. The assurance of things hoped for, those things that we hope for, and the conviction come. So we Walk by faith, not by sight. Our entire relationship with God is based on that trust and faith. James 2 says, without faith it is impossible. In Luke's gospel that we heard just a few moments ago, Jesus has been teaching, taking time to teach his disciples on um, some of the... uh, uh, wonders and, and the um, activities for which he has come to be known with. And so he um, teaches, talks to them about um, subjects like sin, faith, and duty. And even though they have been following him, had been bewildered at times by the demands of uh, of his ministry they respond with these words Lord increase our faith all those things that he was talking to them about just were, were to that place where they just needed to cry out I'm betting that there isn't one person listening in the service who would not Um, identify with the um, disciples. Lord, increase our faith. We find ourselves often in places of of, uh, decision making, meeting new people perhaps, temptations, and other areas of normal, regular life and We are faced with our faith. And often we wish we had more than we had. Lord, the disciples asked, increase our faith. We too would ask the same question. It's a good prayer, by the way, to make in the first place. Well, what is faith? We've heard that word for many, many years. We've grown up with it. We often hear it in regular conversations on television. Hebrews 11 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So we walk by sight because we don't walk by things that are seen, but we walk by faith. Our entire relationship is built on the rock of faith, the conviction of things not seen. So, with, and as James says, 
in chapter 2, yes, without faith it is even impossible to please God. That's the importance of faith. So Lord, help me increase my faith. Yet faith is not just something we do in church or something that's part of Christianity alone. Faith happens daily. It is something that you might not necessarily think about, but it happens every day in normal, everyday situations. We exercise faith daily, sometimes every few minutes. Think about it. When you go shopping, go to a family, go to visit something far away we, in our cars, we have faith that the people coming on the opposite side are going to stay in the, their lane and not come over to ours. Just think about that for a minute. Something we just normally do, but it's an act of faith. Stay in your own lane, Toronto notwithstanding. No, increase my faith, Lord. Well, we have faith in many other areas, too. We walk into a home with a thirsty appetite, turn on the water, and we have faith that the water comes out, and so on and so on. Switch on a light in a dark time, and it comes on. I'm a golfer, and without faith, or it's synonymous, uh, which is synonymous with trust, it would be very difficult play the game. You'd be chasing the ball all over the place, which I must admit I do a lot of times. Golf takes a lot of faith and trust in your swing. So all these things require faith, yet we've learned to do them, sometimes unconsciously. So can we think of that, that which we do, and in daily life, and put it as, and put it into the same um, arena as faith in God. Things that we can um, do to, and to um, live out our lives in faith, both um, within our own small family or church family, and of course in the world around us. And Jesus said to the disciples, and he says to us, if you have faith the size of a, uh, um, <laughs> just forgot the word for a second. Uh, I'll get it. Um, mustard seed. <laughs> if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry bush, he says, um, cast it out into the sea. Just a small little seed. That seed is one of the smallest seeds in the Holy Land. So he's telling us that it only takes small faith sometimes. We don't need to focus and get ourselves worked up that there's all these large, big actions that we're supposed to be doing as part of our faith in God. Those small, tiny acts of faith. Saying hello to somebody that looks lonely. Helping somebody out of a car or with uh, packages if you happen to be uh, in a certain situation. Or just not getting worked up <laughs> when the traffic on the road is so busy. Because those things lead to other things, to bigger things. Faith is this and all and much more. There's an amazing story that I read earlier from the Gospel of John, not least because the blind person received his sight, it too, of course, is a story of faith, healing, 
courage and growing faith. In this story, we see and experience how one man's faith saved him and how that faith continued to grow and grow. And in there are lessons for us about faith, about what faith does and what faith, how, how faith works. And I'm going to take this next time in looking at that scripture and for us to understand some of those things. And as he went along, the Gospel of John says, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it, as long it is this day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. In this one verse, the blind man, it's kind of odd that we never get to know his name, makes an act of faith. Did you hear it? Did you hear what that act was? It is a very small word, two letters, as small as a mustard seed. Yet it can cast a mustard tree into the sea. It can ca make a blind man see. Just two letters. Go. Geo. Go. Jesus said go, and he went. He could not see who was talking to him. Think about that. But something in Jesus' words or his voice was heard something that caused him to get up at that point and to walk into that pond. Now he had been there year after year, day after day, begging around that pond, around that pool. And he probably had lots of people say to him, jump into the pool. Or I can make you see. But this time, he went. Go. Such a small word. Such a easy thing to do. Well, sometimes, sometimes not. The word go is important in the entire Bible. Abraham, God said to Abraham, go. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. The apostle Paul himself blinded. Do you remember that story when he was... Um, uh, met Jesus not far from Damascus and he became blind and he hears a voice saying to him he can't see anybody go into town and you'll be told what you must do and so he does hearing not knowing what comes next for all he knew he was supposed to go see an ophthalmologist but there was other things that uh, he was going to be asked to do. And, uh, and if you know your Bible, you know how important Paul was in the big scheme of things. Well, one of the things that this is teaching us and speaking to us about is, is something that is said in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Faith is, uh, Faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from hearing, not seeing. 
So we hear God's word. We hear it in church. We hear it maybe from friends, TV, um, places maybe where you're studying. And it gives us faith. We hear. We don't see. Now, the, the uh, Pharisees were into seeing, not hearing. They knew the man was blind, that he couldn't possibly have been cured because he was born blind. Must have been a sinner. That they use that word, you hear it often in that story that I read. He's a sinner. And it's a kind of knowledge-based understanding of what God is asking and putting forth. So we don't walk by sight, but we walk by hearing, hearing the word of God. And for this man, the blind man, as he hears, and it's, he's got good hearing, <laughs> he had to all his life, his faith just keeps growing in a very short period of time. He comes to the Pharisees, or he is brought to the Pharisees, and asked to tell, what, what is it that, who is this man who made you blind? And of course, they weren't asking him um, for good reasons. And he answers them, he, he starts to challenge them. Now imagine this, this man has never been to school, can't read, can't see, can't do all the stuff that no, most of us all take for granted. And he starts to challenge these, these Pharisees, these people who um, are in charge of life as they know it. He says, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told them to go to Siloam and wash. So I went, washed, and then I could see. Where is the man, they asked him. I don't know, he says. They then brought to the Pharisees on the following day, which Jesus had made mud and opened man's eyes at the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees who can see <laughs> respond, this man can't be from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Brothers asked, how can a sinner, and others at that meeting said, how can a sinner perform such signs? So the group became divided. So the second time they summoned the blind man and, and asked him more questions. And he said, or they said rather, we know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, he, I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him how, what he did. How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've already told you, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Do you hear the growth of faith? He's now challenging these leaders of religion. He banters with them. Finally, they send them out. And as he's gone out, he meets Jesus and in a remarkable kind of conversation, um, he starts to banter with Jesus himself. So, uh, yeah. So he, um, through this whole process, through this whole story, his faith just keeps getting stronger. And all of that came back to that little word, go. You know, we, we all have had situations where we know we should have done something or felt God was telling us to go and do something. And, and uh, sometimes we did it, sometimes we did not. Sometimes we were frightened. Sometimes we just didn't feel the courage to, uh, to dare, to risk. 
Yet, it is, um, it, different types of uh, things asked for to go can be small or large in our lives, depending on circumstances and so on and so forth. You just don't know. I had a situation in my life not long ago. Um, my cousin, first cousin's daughter, died at the age of 32, cancer. Um, and uh, I hadn't really been in touch with them for very, for very long. It's been years. Sometimes, as you know, the years go on and you don't make those connections like you used to. And um, so when all this happened, we had a um, service funeral service online and uh, that's the first time I'd seen some of the family for quite some time but I felt that as a minister I could do something that some of the others couldn't do so I phoned them up about two weeks later and just asked them how you doing one point in the conversation, he said, thanks for your calling, Steve. Most people are too afraid to ask. We know what that's like. Frightens me, too, sometimes in those conversations when you're in a very emotional situation. But we're called to go. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. God forgives in those times. We never leave out the forgiveness that God is with us and is always nudging us in any situation. So I just end by saying, challenge to where in your life is God asking you to go? What, what words, what maybe feelings or has been nudging you to uh, do something that you might not normally do. And if you do, I really believe you grow in faith. That's how our faith grows. Increase our faith, the disciples said to Jesus, and go. Amen. Well, let us um, join together in our hymn, next hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. The 663 in Voices United.
let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives from the very beginning. Perhaps that beginning was in our childhood. Perhaps as a teenager or into your 20s. Or perhaps that relationship formed in, in later years. Wherever we are, whatever is our station, you are with us. You call us, O oh God, to come forth that we might share in the riches of your wonder and of your love and the hope and peace that it brings. So nudge us, O oh God. Take us out of those places that secure us. Help us to, in good courage, to reach out to others that we may not have thought possible. Give us faith to walk in darkness when we can't see. Give us love to share. Give us new life in Christ. Lord, we pray today for our country as it celebrates an anniversary. And we do so under the uh, cloud of the indig indigenous nations across the country. It is so unbelievable sad that what has happened in places and in the past and very even more sadly still happens today. So we celebrate amidst this grief and we pray for our nation and all its leaders, prime ministers, premiers, those in office everywhere. And we do not leave this time either without a prayer for ourselves. So in this time of silence, O oh God, hear these our prayers. O Lord, hear these our prayers, and in your love answer. And as you have taught us, we come together offering this prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, not, for thine is the glory, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. This time is a time of offering, and as is, um, we make offerings, to our God and to God's church. May you um, be called forth into uh, this opportunity of service. O oh God, receive these, our offerings, and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And our closing hymn today is uh, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Voices United, 670.
tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, says Lord, lead me home. And my way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near when my life almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears, and the night draws near, and the day my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Well, we have come here together from many different places. Let us go united as one body in Christ. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you. Go now, forth to serve. Amen.